Hi class, uh, good afternoon. Um, so really quickly before we get started with anything, I just wanted to get through a couple of announcements. So um, after I did this whole census check, our entire class is left with 12 students. So the possibility that the class might be canceled is a possibility. They will let me know sometime, probably today or tomorrow. Sometime by the end of the week, they'll let me know if the class is canceled. So I will absolutely let you know as soon as they let me know. Um, but you know, unfortunately, like there has been a lot of instances where students have just been signing up for financial aid purposes and they don't attend the class. So we are required to drop them. So I will definitely let you know what happens as soon as I hear anything from the Dean. But as of right now, we're still on, but it might change in the next couple of days. So that's really unfortunate. I am not sure if there are any other argumentation classes that are open um, this summer that I can refer you to, but I can look it up for you all if there are any other classes that are going to still remain open. If any of this happens, I will let you know. But that's the first thing that I wanted uh, to tell you. Hopefully we can continue having this class, but if not, unfortunately, it's the way that you know things played out. Anyhow, so let me, so let's get started with today's lesson. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about chapter two. On Monday, we talked about the like language and we talked about how language gives way to arguments. We talked about the three different types of arguers, which are Brockity's arguers. That's what we talked about on Monday. And today we will be talking about, but we're going to get deeper into arguments. So we're going to talk about how arguments are kind of like stories. Whenever you are saying your side of an argument, you are explaining a different story, an entire world view that somebody might not see the same way as you do. So you construct it and you put it together like you would a story. Um, and for those of you who completed that discussion post this week, that discussion post, the, are you afraid of the dark discussion post? Uh, the reason why I have you uh, look at that, it's because, you know, we look at these shows, right? And when I was in, graduate school when I was like preparing myself to become a teacher, I was looking at all of these shows, right? And I realized that most of these shows like have like loopholes in their storyline. But when you're a kid, you are not trained to see those loopholes yet. So you find everything that you see believable. But the older we get, the more we interact with other people, the more we learn about the world, we start to see those loopholes and those stories start to seem more fake than they used to before. So for example, if you're watching like Goosebumps or Are You Afraid of the Dark or like a scary film like Chucky or It, now that you're older and you're not scared anymore, it's probably because you can tell that there's a lot of loopholes in the story and it doesn't make sense. So it doesn't seem as real. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So let me quickly share the screen. So today we're going to talk about the foundations or argument, which is chapter two. And this is just basically how argument is part of storytelling. So the objectives for the lesson today are going to be explaining the narrative paradigm. Now the narrative paradigm is, there are two steps to that. And the narrative paradigm is what we use as people to kind of like analyze whether a story is believable or not, or whether our argument is like really believable or if it's not. And one of the things that I want to say about the narrative paradigm is that each one of us is kind of going to apply the narrative paradigm differently to the same story, just because we have different life experiences. And one of our life experiences might see the story believable as opposed to somebody who had a completely different life experience. So the narrative paradigm is not going to be something that will look the same for everybody. It will be different based on your experiences. So let's get started. So the first thing that I wanted to tell you is that we as humans, we create, we create a culture through storytelling. So if you look at anything that we have um, seen as we grow up, so we have stories. So we have the boogeyman. For those of us who um, come from like Mexican background, which will be my husband, there's like eh, el cucuy, el coco, there's la llorona, right? Um, there's a boogeyman, there's... Um, different scary things, right, that are out there in the world. And those stories are usually used to kind of get us to behave well. So for example, if you, when you were a kid and your parents wanted you to go to sleep at a certain time, um, they would tell you that if you didn't sleep at that time, the boogeyman will get you. Um, 
So they use these stories to kind of like tell experiences, right? And besides just like the scary things that I'm telling you about, if you look into Native American culture, a lot of the ways that they look at how the world began in Native American culture are through stories, right? Um, so for example, I am Salvadorian. And one of the things that we have in the in the background, like Mayan culture is a book that's called Popol Vuh. And this is a book of how the world began, right? And it's made of these like elaborate storytelling with, you know, different like ways of explaining how the world began, how different groups of people came about. And again, human culture, usually, you know, it began through storytelling. That's how we made sense of things happening in the world. And we tend to learn our, our values from these stories that we hear at a young age. So for example, you learn to obey your parents or you learn to like sleep at a good time or you learn to listen through these stories that your parents will tell you like. For example, a story that I keep thinking about is like Hansel and Gretel, right? Um, like like those uh, two, two like little kids were running around like uh, the forest by themselves and they stepped into somebody's house that they didn't know, lured by the promise of like candy and food, right? And then they ended up getting eaten by the witch. So these stories that we hear are like, don't trust people that you don't know. Don't take candy from strangers. All of these stories are teaching us lessons and values to our particular community. And we tend to understand the world through narratives, not only back in the day that we used to understand it through narratives, but if you think about your history book, your history book is a narrative of how the world or how the country began. So that's how we make sense of things through narratives. And the reason why people look at these narratives and we learn better through these narratives, as opposed to our parents telling us like a very elaborate explanation as to why we should go to bed early, we learn through these because the narratives are appealing, they have a lot of repetition, and they're very enjoyable to listen to. So as opposed to your parent telling you, uh, parents telling you, you need eight hours of sleep because you growth and development and all of that stuff, it is more thrilling to hear the story of the boogeyman coming to get you at a certain time, right? Because it is more appealing to you. And that's why stories tend to become our reality. That's why you have different people who are investigators who go out in the world and examine this like creatures or these stories right um trying to like see if they can find whether these creatures are real like you know um the chupacabra was one of them right people go out and see if they can find if it's like a real thing um so that's one of the things that i kind of wanted to tell you like we are as humans we're just people who are drawn to stories because we find them enjoyable right and then these stories become our reality and kind of like what I was talking about, some of the childhood stories that taught you some valuable lessons. So we were talking about, you know, um, I was sharing how La Llorona was one of them. Um, we have Hansel and Gretel, Gretel. We have Red Riding Hood, right? Um, like, you know, don't trust the wolf or tear candies for the wolf or anything like that. Um, cool. So next we're going to move on to history. So like people, one of the things that we tend to do as humans is that we tend to understand our history like what happens next based on history. So for example, if we tend to compare what's happening now to something that happened in the past. So like we tend to go live by the idea of history repeats itself. So we look at the past to see what will happen in the future to see, to make sense of current events. And, and like, that's what brings me up to my first question. Like, why do you think people are so afraid of a World War III? Like people have been talking about a possible World War III happening in the next, few years right like the nuclear war with like bombs on all these like technology that we have now um and people are so afraid of this idea because for those people who wrote history who were present during world war one and world war two they remember how horrible it was right so they look at that and they say well if that was bad with all the technology that we have now it's going to be like even worse right um and one of the things that I also want to tell you is that not all stories are true and not all stories are created the same way. There are certain narratives who that have been written and that we pass down from generation to the next, but these, these narratives are not right. Uh, they have been skewed, they have been messed with, they have been ruined. So like think about history books, right? In most history books, like we only like women's history, African-American history, Native American history, 
uh, his, like, you know, Chicano Latinx history, they get, we, if we get anything in a history book, it's probably like a little box at the bottom, like the little pink box or like one page describing like a standout individual, right? Like Pocahontas or like Susan B. Anthony or Rosa Parks, right? We get like really tiny little boxes in history books. And that kind of like shows like how skewed history is because history is written from the perspective of people who create or control the history, right? Another thing that I wanted to bring up into the situation is when we think about the history of Thanksgiving, right? Um, for years upon years, we have been taught that Thanksgiving was this like really amicable celebration for the Native Americans and the pilgrims came together and shared foods and they just enjoyed this like day of Thanksgiving, right? And it's not like that. Um, and the reason why I'm bringing that up is because my daughter, she's four years old and she goes to daycare. And I think it was a couple of years ago when she was like barely two, some parents were getting really, really angry because the daycare was more on the progressive side and they weren't doing the whole um, Native Americans and pilgrims type of like exchange for the kids. And some of the parents are like, oh, they're robbing kids of history and all these events. And I was hearing the principal explaining to them, well, that's not how it really happened. And we're not going to really lie to the kids by saying that it was like this amicable event. We're going to tell them that there was interaction, but we're not going to tell them what kind of interaction it was, right? So it's really interesting to see that. But people are so stuck on these narratives that when something changes or somebody challenges that narrative, you don't want to listen, you get upset, and you get defensive. That will be an excellent example of that. And that's how usually people uh, kind of like react to arguments. Um, okay, so going back to the question that I was going to ask you, can somebody tell me like in the little chat, or if you want to speak up, that's fine. What did you learn about women's history in high school? Because I am really curious to hear what they're teaching you all since you are on the younger side, because I didn't really learn very much. Seems like nothing, right? Not very much. Not much. We have Garrett saying that not much. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay, so like we learn about, you learn about wasps, Andrew, and Garrett says that he didn't learn very much. I mean, seems like it hasn't changed much. Um, hopefully when my daughter will, goes to high school, we have like a little bit of a different story. I mean, the only thing that I remember, it's like, the only thing that I remember is like literally Susan B. Anthony and probably Harriet Tubman at the very bottom of the textbook. That's probably the only thing that I remember, which is pretty sad. But thank you for sharing. So the next thing that I'm going to get to is the narrative paradigm. Now, for those of you who are looking at the diagram that I have up on the screen right now, it's probably bringing you some really terrible memories of high school English. And that's okay, because I have those terrible memories as well. So does anybody know what this diagram on the screen is? No? Does it look familiar? Nobody took the AP English, the plot. Thank you, Andrew. So that's plot. So this is a diagram for a plot of a story. So when you were in like high school English, probably 10th, 10th, 9th or 10th grade, probably. I don't remember, it was a long time ago. 9th or 10th grade, when you were in high school, your teacher would give you this diagram and they would say, okay, so like look at the story, read this book, whatever it was. Um, in my case, it was Romeo and Juliet and plug in the parts where are the exposition, rising action, climax, falling action, and denouement, right? And this would explain how a good story is put together and happens. So the exposition is when we're introducing the characters, kind of introducing the setting. Rising action is when like a conflict starts happening. Climax is when the conflict is at its worst, right? And there's like some type of like, usually some type of conflict that's really bad, uh, falling in, it kind of like gets resolved and we have falling action and at the very end we have like it wrapped up really nicely the very end right so usually that's how stories like a good story has all these parts well put together and it makes sense it's coherent right so like i was saying at the very beginning not all stories and in this case not all arguments are created equal we have to be able to why are why is it that some arguments seem more appealing and more real and they connect with us over others? And the reason why is because of the plot diagram. And that's the first part of the narrative paradigm model that I wanted to go over. It's called narrative probability. 
When we talk about narrative probability, we're looking at the plot diagram that I was discussing. So we're trying to look at whether the story is coherent and well put together. So for example, if the story follows the plot uh, diagram really well, then that means that the story was well put together, right? Um, so we have to see like, is the story coherent? Is it credible? Do the characters act the way that they're supposed to? Do the characters' actions make sense? Does the setting make sense? Um, and one of the things that we also tend to look at is whether there is a resolution to that story. Does the story tie up really nicely at the very end? Now, I don't know about you, but the example that I like to use for this is I am one of those people that doesn't like cliffhangers in films. And let's say that I was going to see like, um, like a saga film or whatever, like, for example, like if I go, go to see like, when I went to see Fifty Shades like a while back, I went to see Fifty Shades. And then I went to see like the different parts of like uh, the Hunger Games and all of that. At the very end of each one of those installments, there was a cliffhanger. And as humans, most of us get really, really irritated when we get to a cliffhanger. Have you ever wondered why you get irritated when you get to a cliffhanger? The reason why we get irritated is because it doesn't follow the plot diagram. It doesn't follow exposition, rising action, climax, falling action, and denouement. We want things to be wrapped up really nicely at the end in order for it to make sense to us, right? And one of the things that we do when we're looking at an argument is everything has to make sense. So when you're listening to a friend who's telling you a story and parts of their story don't make sense, you can tell that they're lying right away. So in my case, I had a colleague of mine who kept telling me that people kept approaching him um, at Coachella, this was years back at Coachella because they wanted him to like model for a campaign. And I'm just thinking to myself, first of all, like, let me stop you there because I already don't believe your story. Like, how are there going to be random photographers at Coachella following some random person that nobody has ever heard of to ask them to be for a modeling contract? That in itself makes no sense because again, I was looking at, are these people acting according to the way that these type of people act? Is this the right setting for this could happen and take place? No, then the argument did not make sense and their story did not make sense. So again, when you're looking at narrative probability, remember that it refers to the plot diagram. Is your story coherent? Is everybody acting the way that they're supposed to? Is it well put together? If you can poke a lot of holes into their plot diagram, then the story doesn't make sense. Questions in regards to the first part of the narrative paradigm. No? Cool. So yes, I'm gonna get into the whole alien contact thing, okay, I promise. So the second part of the narrative paradigm, so the first part, narrative probability, is it coherent? Second part, narrative fidelity, refers to whether the story or the argument makes sense with reality, with what we know as reality, okay? So again, with the story that I was telling you about, about my classmate who said that people were following him around Coachella to ask him for a, to be in a modeling campaign, would that be something that could happen to an average person at this place? I was thinking probably not. Usually like if there's photographers or like paparazzi or whatever, they're usually following a celebrity. It wouldn't happen for an average person. That's not, that's just like chilling there, not doing anything, right? Out of the ordinary. So I was thinking, no, that story does not match reality. It doesn't seem like it's likely to happen in our like in daily, everyday life. Now, one of the things that we do when it comes to narrative fidelity is that based on the values we hold and the experiences we hold, that's how we create our social reality. So for example, if you know, if I was one of those people that actually had been like you know had an encounter with somebody who wanted me to do a modeling contract and it had gone well then that probably makes sense to me right his story would completely make sense to me so when we decide whether a story matches social reality or whether it makes sense with reality is because usually we have values or experiences that match with that story and this is when i come in with the whole alien contact situation um, and the question that I want to ask is like, why do you think people have such a hard time believing in aliens or just like believing others who have experienced alien abductions? Why is it that people find it so hard to believe? There's a lot of research on it. If you call it research, I don't know.
No, we don't know. Um, I would think because maybe it's not common. It's, like, yeah, go ahead. It like um, maybe the experiences that people compare with each other that have had experiences um, can be slightly different. So therefore they might think like, oh, your experience wasn't real or they try to debunk, you know, certain um, experiences based on the technology we have today. And so that's the only thing I can think of. <laughs> And you are bringing up an excellent point. I am glad that you brought that up. That is amazing. So one of the things that I watch the show Ancient Aliens, you know, I watch it a lot because I love conspiracy theory and things like that. That's what I do on my free time. And one of the things that they do is that they have an alien convention every single year. Now, this was like obviously pre-COVID, right? When people could gather in large amounts of people, like things that, you know, are no longer heard of at this point in time. But they would gather like whether like they would have an alien convention that was created by like, you know, the, the history channel, the creators of ancient aliens, and they would meet in some part of the United States, a major city. Um, they would meet once a year. And one of the things that they would do is they would have like, like a little, I guess, like a little segment on the convention where they would have people come in and share their alien abduction stories. And they would have people come up to like microphones and like just like share their stories right and one of the things that the rest of the people would do kind of like what you mentioned Imelda was look at the stories and compare them to like my experience like my alien abduction and comparing it to your alien abduction to see if it's real or not real right so the scholars that were there like you know the guy with the crazy hair and all that who was who are there in the panel they would kind of like look and look at the bits and pieces of the story and see if it matched up with other um, experiences or abductions that other folks have had and that's how they would decide whether the story would be real or not but like you know I wanted to go to one of those conventions just to see like how people would like express themselves and explain their alien abduction experiences my husband is not okay with it because he thinks that people will think we're crazy so that's what we haven't gone but obviously like these people go to these events because they want other folks to support them to listen to them to believe in their stories right but at the same time the rest of the people who are present during this com convention they're also saying hmm does it match what happened to me does it match what we historically have recorded uh, like as an alien abduction mm, does it really match then it's probably not real and again that's what we usually do when somebody is telling us an argument, telling us a story. We usually go into narrative probability. Can we poke holes in the thing in the story? And two, does it seem like it, it would happen in real life? And we do this automatically. Like we automatically have trained ourselves to do this. And you might next time that you are listening to a story and to an argument that somebody else is telling you, sit down with it and think about it. Like, how did I know that I agree with this? And how do I know that I disagree with it? what made me what gave me that feeling and you probably already did the narrative fidelity and probability in your head so again next time that you also think about alien contact it'll remind you of narrative fidelity and again those two parts the narrative probability and narrative fidelity are part of the narrative paradigm and this is what we use to make sense of arguments and stories now the next thing that i wanted to talk to you about and this is the last slide for class today I wanted to talk to you all about about just entering arguments. So I think um, one of the things that I have seen is a lot of people in the past um, have taught me, uh, have asked me these questions. They're like, well, you know, like, how do I know that? Um, how do I know whether an argument is worth pursuing? Like, how do I like, why should I drop an argument? How do I argue with somebody if I want to preserve the relationship with that person? Is it possible to argue with somebody whose relationship is really important to me, but at the same time, I believe in this cause so deeply? Now, here are my answer to those questions. So before you enter an argument, you have to consider the following things. First thing, and it's the most important thing is, how will this affect your relationship? So for example, if it's with your significant other, your partner, is this going to be a make it or break it moment? Like, will this argument save the relationship or completely end the relationship? Or is this a trivial argument that if you have it, the relationship could still keep going and it will just be something small. 
right? So for example, think about the magnitude of these two arguments. You arguing with your partner about, you know, which milk you should get from the supermarket, right? As opposed to as arguing with your partner as to whether you should have children or not. Do you see how like the magnitude of both of those arguments are different? So obviously the argument about which milk you pick up at Target, it's completely like a trivial argument that you can have and you'll probably laugh about it later. But the one about the children is an argument that could either make your relationship or break it. So think about the magnitude and how it will affect your relationship. Next, will it change the mind of somebody's deep ideologies? Now, my example to this is I, I have very religious family members in my family from different types of different religions, different branches of, of Christianity, right? And one of the things that they like to do is when they get together, they like to compare their Bibles and their books and stuff, you know, they like to do that. I know that sounds really funny. I know, but uh, trust me, it's not, it's not funny. It's actually pretty painful to see. Uh, so they get together and they begin comparing their Bibles. They'll be like, you know, their, you know, books for their organization, church or whatnot. And they compare and they start getting into this argument as to whose religion is better and is closer to the truth which religion is a fake and which one is the true religion right they've had this argument since i was a child probably and i'm 30 years old now and it hasn't changed right the arguments get heated they get really nasty sometimes but it doesn't really change anybody's ideologies like one person is still, you know, very much part of the religion and so is the other, like they haven't changed sides. So is it an argument that it's going to change somebody's ideologies? Like, is there a possibility that I'm going to change your mind of a very deep set idea that you have? If it doesn't, then it's probably not worth entering because I'm just going to be talking to the air, right? Um, and that's one of the things that I keep telling my family members. I tell them, you know, you have this argument year upon year, yet still nothing changes. Is it something that you should continue to have? Probably not, right? Next thing, another thing that you have to consider is that people are not blank slates. People will have an opinion on things, whether they're actually like really into it or not. So if you talk to someone, anyone, that surrounds you, they will have an opinion on anything. So I will talk to like a family member and I will tell them, hey, have you all heard about, um, you know, the legalization of like, you know, certain psychedelic drugs? Oh, all drugs are bad. Like nothing should be legalized. People have an opinion, even if they're just heard about the topic or know about the topic or know something similar to it, they will have an opinion whether they're informed or not. So think about that. Even if you think that somebody or a group, group of people or a room of people will not have a strong opinion about a topic, they probably have some knowledge about it. Whether it's right or wrong, I don't know, but they have knowledge about it. So when you enter an argument, enter it knowing that other people will have an opinion about your topic, regardless of how much they know about it. Uh, and that was that's all that I wanted to talk about. So again, when it comes to relationships, how will it affect your relationships? Are you willing to end a relationship due to the argument? Or is the relationship so important that you would just rather put it aside? So if it's like, for example, your parent, right? And your parent believes really deeply about a topic and you believe the total opposite, is it going to be an argument that you want to have with your parent and are you okay with that relationship not being mended after the argument? So these are things that you have to think about, right? So I usually like run these through my head. Is it gonna hurt my relationship? Am I okay if it's ruined? And some relationship you, you will find that it's okay for the relationship to like end. Um, I have a specific case where I had a friendship, right? And the only reason why I bring it up is because we're actually going to be bridesmaids for my friend's wedding, right? We used to be a group of three best friends and our friend that we have in common now is getting married, right? And we, me and the other lady ended our friendship years ago because it was one of these moments where the importance of the argument was way more important to have than the relationship that we had at that time, right? And I was okay with letting that relationship go because my feelings, ideals, topics were way more important than the relationship at the time right? But now that's going to come and bite me in the butt because we will both be bridesmaids and are going to be planning the bridal shower together. So 
y'all wish me luck with that because it's going to be intense. Anyways, with that being said, that's all that I have for today. So go ahead and enjoy your weekend. Uh, make sure that you submit the rest of the assignments for this week. And hopefully, hopefully they will allow us to keep our class open. If they don't, I will let you know as soon as they let me know. I promise. And I will see if they can send me which other section, if there are other sections that you can go into that are still enrolling. So um, I'll let you know. And I hope you have a good weekend. If we don't see each other anymore, have a great weekend. Mm -hmm. Have a great summer. I have a question. Um, yes, of course. If it is possible to join a different class, like how often is that done where they take all the students from the classes that are being canceled? You know, it is actually very common for that okay. to be done. That mm -hmm. happened last semester. Um, mm -hmm. Last semester, the same thing happened with the students kind of like just using the classes for, for financial aid. Um, mm -hmm. My friend ended up taking all the people from somebody else's class. Oh, wow. Okay. So since it's online, them. it's a little easier to like. Yeah, okay. it's a little easier. So, or what might happen if there's another um, speech or six, they might merge them together. Mm -hmm. So that might happen. Hopefully they'll merge it into our, our class. So you all don't have to make any more changes. So right. hopefully we'll bring the students from the other class into this class. And mm -hmm. you know, it, hopefully it continues like that, but I will let you know. But you have good chances of it happening. Right. How would they determine like which class merges into which? Was that depending on how many students? Like it depends on how many students. students. Um, and yeah. we are literally like just a couple students away from like being able to keep the class. Mm -hmm. That's one. And two, it also depends on the seniority of the faculty. So uh, mm -hmm. if it's like a full time faculty, they'll probably take you all and put them into that class because they have the seniority. Right. So, Regardless of what happens, I'm sure you all will be okay. I will talk to the chair to make sure that you are put into a class okay. and um, I'll, I'll let you know anything I hear. I greatly appreciate it. <laughs> no Thank problem. You. I, I yeah. don't want people to suffer. I have a question mm -hmm. of this too then in that sense. By chance, you know, since like, uh, I guess the summer semester has already started, how like it would affect the transcripts and everything and show the dropping and like adding of a class or would it just be more uh, just like in a sense the teacher switch? um so well i mean like it depends on like how many other classes are open but again like they usually will let you know if our class is canceled they will let you know which class is open and they will contact the faculty member and they will let them know that you are coming to their class okay so and we would get like a number like the class number to be able to register for that class right i am going to they will probably tell you which class mm -hmm. it is Okay. but they're not going to give you a permission number that again like you were um, saying it's kind of up to the instructor but i can like you know i can tell the chair to talk to the instructor to make sure that they take you in uh, i see i'm okay. going to i'm going to fight for you all don't worry thank I will you fight. thank That'd you be great <laughs> yeah. no problem but for awesome. right now, just relax because for right now we're okay but mm -hmm. if they let me know anything i will send you a message as soon as i know okay and then um for this coming week uh, I noticed we don't have Zoom meeting sessions for Tuesday and Thursday. It's like an every other week thing. Is that correct? It's supposed to be weekly, but weekly? I will okay. check into that. I will yeah, check into that. But see. if you go onto this link, it will allow yeah. you to log in. Okay. Yeah, because I was looking right here. It says every two weeks on Tuesday and Thursday on the um, Zoom meeting schedule. That is really um, weird, and I will fix it. <laughs> yeah, thank um, you. I was like, oh, two every other week. Like that's that's, <laughs> that's crazy um, and, because it's summer. <laughs> I know we will be meeting. Like usually, we would meet once a week if it wasn't yeah. during the regular semester. But since it's summer, it's twice. But I will definitely right. let you know if I hear anything, and if we are able to keep our class, I will fix that. Okay. All right. Awesome. So I hope Sounds you have a good week. Relax. We'll, we'll all fight for you all so that you thank can you. get a class and get your credits. Thank you, mm -hmm. professor. No Thank you so much. A, no problem. I also had a question uh, about the email I sent you. Yes. Um, I try to, I, I just looked right now. I don't think I saw them uh, post it on the flip grid. Um, it looks different on your end than it does on mine. So I will okay. definitely let you know if there's anything that looks missing. I will let you know. Okay. Because I recorded the two responses and it said it would take some time and I saw that other people upload it. So I just wanted to know if it was like something with like my phone, the app, or if it was. Sometimes yeah. because a lot of people are using the app at that moment, it does that. So um, I will let you know if there's anything that's missing and don't worry about it. I'll let you know. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Bye. Bye. Have a good weekend as well. You too.